Joining me now is Congressman Ted Lieu, a Democrat from California, Batya Unger Sargon, opinion editor at Forward.com, Mehdi Hassan, columnist at The Intercept and host of Upfront on Al Jazeera Inc. And Jennifer Rubin, opinion writer at the Washington Post. And California, I'm a congressman, I'm going to go to you first on this. Um, what do we know about whether or not there is, in fact, a link between this suspect and a previous arson? And just what do we know in general uh, about who this person was and the inspiration that this person is claiming from other mass attacks on Jewish people? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Joy. My heart goes out to the victims of the synagogue shooting in Poway, California. Uh, my understanding is that Lori Kay got in front of the shooter to protect her rabbi, and she passed away. And then the rabbi, who was shot, continued to finish her sermon for Passover. That is amazing strength in the face of evil. What we do know is that there has been a stunning rise in white nationalism since 2017. According to the Anti-Defamation League, there has been a nearly 60% increase in anti-Semitic incidents. And then from 2017 to 2018, there's been a rise in white nationalist groups. This shooter, from reading his manifesto, clearly was influenced by white nationalism ideology. And we need to stamp out white nationalism and anti-Semitism in all its evil forms. And so, Bachi, I want to come to you here because the, this person writing this open letter um, and, and posted on 8chan, 8chan cited inspiration from the Christchurch attack, claimed attack, uh, an attack on a, on, a, on a Muslim mosque, an arson attack. And so what you're seeing is this kind of amalgam effect where these shootings seem to be both anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim, but kind of in the same ideology. I definitely think that what you're seeing here is the ways in which the Jewish community and the Muslim community are facing a common threat from white nationalism. You're also seeing, very movingly, the coming together of these communities in support for each other. Right. I do think there was another aspect to the manifesto. It was clearly a white nationalist manifesto. He is a white supremacist, the person who wrote this. He also mentioned things like Jews controlling the slave trade and Jews controlling politicians, things that you hear often on the left as well. So I think it's really important for us to think about what is our response to this. And one response that I think is not appropriate is people who come out and tell Jews which anti-Semites and which anti-Semitisms they're allowed to be afraid of and they're allowed to be worried about. Yeah, and so, I mean, the where do you think that the... Um, the energy from this is coming from. I mean, there, there, there are a lot of people that look at the Charlottesville march as a really sort of seminal moment, really horrific moment in U.S. history when you saw people willing to not wear hoods but just come out and openly chant, Jews will not replace us, you know, in just openly to do that with tiki torches as if it was almost like a Klan march. So is, 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 there, is there something that you can point to that is the rise of this? Is this about the politics in the country right now? What is it about? Look, it's undeniable that the age of Trump has seen a rise, an exponential rise in anti-Semitic attacks, anti-Semitic rhetoric, anti-Semitism. That's true. At the same time, the Jewish community very much has a consensus feeling that they're being attacked from both sides. So while the white nationalist threat is much more physical and real and murderous, at the same time when you go to Jewish communities, you're feeling the fear that is really pervasive. Yeah. Mehdi Hassan, let me bring you in on this because I know that you have a lot of thoughts on this. It is, it, it, there, it's, it's undeniable that statistically that the anti-Semitic incidences um, have gone way up under this president. Um, the Anti-Defamation League tracks how many anti-Semitic attacks. You can see it there that it's gone from uh, 941 attacks in 2015 all the way to 1980 now. And we know that there is this kind of sort of widespread open um, white nationalist ideology and ideation that is proliferating, not just online, but yeah. physically, people showing up to places and proclaiming it. Yeah. Definitely, Joy. And let me just start by saying this. That I want to offer my condolences and solidarity with my Jewish brothers and sisters who are still mourning the worst anti-Semitic massacre in U.S. history just six months ago, as you mentioned in your intro, and to have this again happen now at the end of Passover is unspeakable. Uh, and, you know, this guy claims to have also attacked a mosque as well recently. You know, we Muslims and Jews, as you and other panelists have pointed out, are now the victims of what is an epidemic 
of white nationalist terror, Joy. Over the last 10 years, 70% um, of the terrorist-related deaths in this country have been at the hands of right-wing extremists. Last year in 2018, every single one of the 50 terrorist deaths on U.S. soil came at the hands of white nationalists. This month alone, Joy, in the United States, in real life, a guy burned down three black churches in Louisiana. Uh, another guy tried to run over an interracial couple in New Orleans. Another guy was sentenced to prison in Oregon for running over and murdering a young black man. Uh, in California, a man drove his car into a crowd of pedestrians uh, because he thought they were Muslim, put a teenage girl in a coma, and yesterday we saw this man, this alleged killer, 19-year-old who they've arrested, walking into a synagogue and opening fire and killing one person, injuring three. This is an epidemic, and we have a president who will not, who not only will not acknowledge that we have an epidemic of white nationalist terror after New Zealand said just a few people, he's providing the mood music for it. That's that is the reality we face, and that is very scary reality, Joy. Yeah, and you know, um, normally, Jennifer Rubin, what would happen in a situation like this is that you would, you would have a sense of national emergency that comes out of the White House. And a typical president, whether they were a Republican president or a Democratic president, would be doing something to try to beat back what is obviously an anti-Semitic an anti tide, an anti-Muslim tide, a nationalist tide. No one can deny that it's happening, but you've seen this administration really pull back the resources to even investigate it or to quantify it. So what can the American people do if the White House is not exhibiting the normal kind of emergency footing that we would normally see? Well, you make a key point, which is that this administration is making it worse. They're making it worse because they won't identify white nationalism as a major catastrophe, not only in this country, but around the world. Trump, after New Zealand, of course, said it was just a few people. He wasn't concerned about it. Um, he is so obsessed with um, Muslim or uh, rather uh, radical Islamic terrorism that he set up all of these nonsensical um, provisions like the Muslim ban um, and he's really ignoring the core issue here and I think it's undeniable that when he himself talks about um, being a nationalist, when he says um, in this language of um, xenophobia um, and hatred about immigrants, um, this seeps into the culture. This emboldens people. This gives people who have these views um, confirmation that they're not outside the mainstream, that they're perfectly accepted yeah. in American society. And um, that has to end. Um, you absolutely need it from the White House, but it can come from other places. Um, Congress can come together. Um, we've seen, um, as was pointed out, uh, the Muslim community, the Jewish community come together. Um, religious leaders, faith leaders, governors, mayors. Um, and I think there has to be an outpouring um, and a demand for leadership. And I understand so personally that we look to the president in times like this, but I think it's time to realize he's not going to help. He's making things worse. Yeah. And so I think we have to organize ourselves collectively, and I think we have to establish um, some boundaries for public debate and for public speech by the president of the United States, who is now trying to rewrite history and deem Charlottesville all about a historical debate um, or historical uh, movement, um, which, by the way, would be in favor of a um, vicious slave owner who rebelled against the United States of America. Um, he is not going to help. And for that reason, I think the rest of us have a enormous responsibility, Democrats, Republicans, not to squabble about ourselves, not to say who's the worst anti-Semite or who's the worst uh, white nationalist, but really as a moment of national unity to come together and condemn this. Yeah. This has to end. Yeah. Uh, well, then let's, let's go to, we have a congressman. Uh, we happen to have a congressman in, in the House. Uh, Ted Lieu, what can Congress do? I mean, uh, funding emerges from the House of Representatives. You've seen this administration pull back on, tr on supporting the Department of Homeland Security Department that's supposed to be, you know, in charge of beating back or investigating uh, white nationalism. They don't seem to want to do that. What can Congress do? Yeah. Uh, one issue I've worked on every year I've been in office is to make sure we have enough funding for security grants to places of worship. I believe we need to have an increase in that funding, which is operated through FEMA, and it's available to all places of worship, whether it's a synagogue or a mosque, and people can apply. And it's something that we need to work together on a bipartisan basis in Congress. I'm also glad that you mentioned Charlottesville. I just want to make very clear, that was not a march in honor of Robert E. Lee. 
there was a march in support of anti-Semitism, of hate, of white nationalism, and it's just important that we call it what it was. Yeah, and if it had been a march uh, just in honor of Robert E. Lee, it had been a march in honor of a, a vicious slave owner who thought that he had the right to own human beings as property. Um, Bacha, what can uh, citizens do? I think one thing that it's really important to remember is that um, Jews in America are in a very interesting place. On the one hand, we have huge amounts of privilege that other minorities don't have, huge amounts of institutional power. And on the other hand, we're extremely vulnerable to these kinds of attacks, like our Muslim brothers and sisters and like our African American brothers and sisters. And so I would urge people to keep that in mind when they're, you know, seeing Jews in moments of power and also in moments like these. And really what I'm seeing in my community is Jews acknowledging that, using their privilege to stand up for other minorities, but also insisting on their right to protect themselves. Yeah. Uh, and Mehdi, what about the media? Because it is, it's complicated to do these stories because you don't want to give people like this uh, person any notoriety you certainly yeah. don't want to you know put their views out there and their their you know their open letters or whatever it is they're saying but how can we is there something the media can do to be helpful here no, look, I definitely agree that we can't give them notoriety. But on the other hand, we have to call a spade a spade. I mean, uh, we need to talk about this problem. And, Joy, you and I have talked about it in the past, about how the media has disproportionately covered uh, horrible and uh, condemnable Muslim terrorist acts, but has ignored white nationalist terror. The studies are very clear in the, you know, uh, on the facts about that. And I think we have to call this out. We have a president who ran for election. Remember, he used to say, oh, Barack Obama won't say the words radical Islamic terrorism. He said he's unfit to hold office because he won't call our enemy an enemy. Enemy. Well, will Trump use this idea? You know, will he talk about white nationalist terror? Are we going to hear him say anything? Of course he won't. But we need to be able to do that and say that and call it out because that is the real threat we face. Right now. This is not just domestic terrorism. This is a transnational problem. Yeah. This is happening across the globe. The guy in San Diego says he was inspired by the guy in New Zealand. The guy in New Zealand says he was inspired by the guy in Norway, Breivik, who killed 77 people in 2011. This is a national security threat, a global threat. You need a president who's going to take it seriously. And yet, this is a president about whom white nationalists after he was elected remember what they were chanting here in dc joy hail trump hail trump that was richard spencer after he was inaugurated the editor of the uh, neo-nazi daily stormer website said and i quote trump is setting us free from the racist horse's mouth joy yeah yeah but there, it it should be an issue in 2020 let's see if the democratic candidates take it up since obviously the guy in the white house is not uh, going to congressman ted lu thank you batya unger sargon thank